It's February 1st, 2021, and here we are again, another episode of Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And it is me, Daniel Hallen, and welcome back. Yes, welcome back, everyone. <laughs> um, before we get into things, I know, Danielle, I can see your excitement. I know you really want to go off about it, but look, honestly, I just, I can't talk about it. Okay, but I'm like really bad at keeping secrets. Well, I, you know, it's it's just one of those things. There's like NDAs in place, and we're talking about kind of a big company, and I just don't, I could get in a lot of trouble. So we're going to have to leave that, and we're just going to have to move on to a different topic, okay? So uh, have you seen any good trailers lately? Actually, now that you mention it, I saw kind of a cool one the other day. I feel like a lot of people would probably enjoy it. It was something called Crime Scene something or another. Oh, Oh, crime scene, uh, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel, coming yes. to Netflix on February 10th. Absolutely, that was it. I'm pretty positive that most people would probably absolutely love it. Yeah, you know, that looked kind of interesting to me, too. I wish I could speak more, but, mm, you know, uh, I'm just not just... into... I'm not into self-promotion, Danielle. I'm so shy. Oh, abs and absolutely not. I guess everyone <laughs> will just have to, you know, show up on the 10th of February to Netflix to see for themselves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Four episodes coming February 10th to Netflix. You Crime After Crime fans might recognize a face. Um, yeah. Okay. That's, I think I've said too much. I'm, I'm hearing there's lawyers at the door. So <laughs> you'll fight them off. I'll send my warrior flies. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've you obtained go. some now to fight off yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get your loopholes ready, Danielle. I'm going to need them. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's get right to business. It's time for voting results with Danielle for the last episode Craziest Hiding Place. Now, Danielle told the story of the Toys R Us roof man who lived between the walls of the store, had an awesome Spider-Man bedroom set up. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> totally rad. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and then he was also living in kind of a neighboring uh, Circuit City that was closed. Mm -hmm. uh, I told the story of the Newton Gang, the last holdouts of the Wild West that robbed more banks and trains than any other famous outlaw, and on a drunken night, buried some of their loot and forgot where it was. <laughs> I'm never getting over it. <laughs> it was a good ever. episode. Yeah. It was such a good episode. Those were hilarious stories. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, uh, we have changed our feed recently. So there's a chance that you guys might have seen. There was all kinds of weird things that the different companies yeah. did. You might have seen a message that said you're at the wrong feed, even though you're actually at the right feed. If you're getting today's episode, you, you've, you've got a good feed. So if you missed last month's episode, it's probably down there. It might be right below that one. But, yeah, and it's not one that you want to miss. <laughs> yeah. It was a good one. Yeah, there's all kinds of weirdness going on. Like our artwork has also changed. So some places are showing the new artwork. Some places are showing the old. I don't know. We're, we're trying to do our best. But uh, yeah. just to give you guys a little heads up. So uh, now on to the voting results for Craziest Hiding Place. We actually had a first. We have never had this happen. In 30 episodes, we've never had this happen. Danielle, what happened? All right, you guys. So over on the Twitter poll, I received 73% of the votes and 27% went to John, meaning that based off of the Twitter poll, I was definitely in the lead. But then you go to the website poll and 49% for me and 51% to John. Meaning uh -huh. I won the Twitter poll and you won the website poll. We have never had it split like that ever. We've never had that split. And um, I don't know what's really fair, Danielle. Should we just call it a tie? I mean, you win the Twitter one. I won the website. There we go. Just it's tied. Um. No, <laughs> not, not too fair. Uh, we do um, have the technology. Yeah. Um, we're able to boil it down to individual votes and that's what we did. We tallied those up and we found out the true winner. Who is it, Danielle? I won, but I will say I would have split it equally with you. <laughs> <laughs> I would have, I would have done it. <laughs> we can't split it. There's only one mug. The mug has to be in one place and it's staying with Danielle for the time being. Now we also wanted to touch on these stats look a little funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. Someone out there is a, is a little dedicated, and I'm honestly loving it. <laughs> I am too. 
I'm loving it more because it looks like they're dedicated in terms of having John win. So uh, they are, man. Someone put in a whole lot of extra votes for John, and I think that is the best thing ever. Yeah, seriously, because. If the percentages hold up, um, they probably had to put in a few hundred votes to tilt the poll that way. <laughs> and I want to send you great. a free shirt, whoever did that. I know someone needs to own up, not because you're in trouble, but because we genuinely think this is one of the best things ever. That was great. Seriously. That's so much dedication and love. <laughs> I think anyone could appreciate that. Definitely. Definitely. We appreciate you guys. And, you know, we're, we're here having fun. We're, we're glad yeah. that you guys are, too. So on to today's topic, the most absurd defense. And I'm so excited for this one. I'm so ready. Um, oh, before we get to that, I do want to point out that since I'm, I haven't seen the Crime After Crime mug in so long, I've, I've forgotten what it looks like. I'm using the mug sent to us by a caring Crime After Crime listener. The Lacucci Florida mug is back. <laughs> There, honestly, if you had to substitute the crime after crime mug, that's the only other option. And I'm only slightly jealous that I don't have a Lacucci mug. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even say it. <laughs> it's one of my favorite words. Lacucci, Lacucci, Florida. Lacucci, Florida. Um, also, I'm throwing it up, Danielle, because uh, my story might involve a Florida man. That's yes, how serious I? I am about today's competition. Okay, well, my story involves a Florida woman, so clearly we're going to bring forward two very great stories today. Oh, goodness, goodness. Florida never fails us. <laughs> head to head. All right, most absurd defense. What are some of the lamest excuses that we could find? And did they actually help out the criminal, or did they just help a podcast? We're going to find out, <laughs> starting with Danielle's story. I'm ready. So, obviously, as someone who's constantly looking into true crime, researching trials, finding bizarre criminals, I'm sure even you as a listener, you've heard quite a few strange defenses at least a handful of times. Typically, they're very basic, you know, it wasn't me, or claims that make absolutely no sense and are very easy to see through. We've even spoken about them before on the podcast. But it's not every day that I come across an absurd defense that caused enough people to hesitate that it ended in three separate trials. Wow. The def I know. The defense given by infamous Dahlia DiPolito is one for the books, and some of you may be very familiar with her. The story starts off as innocent and quickly takes a sharp turn nobody was expecting. I'm just curious, John, have you heard of Dahlia DiPolito? No. You no. might recognize the story the deeper we get into it. Okay. But you've so already Dahlia got me nervous because the three trials thing, like, oh, man, that's serious. Like, mm, that, that defense is... And when you hear this defense, like I can't wait to put the defense out there. Just drop a line and we're all going to take five minute break to just laugh. Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so Dahlia was 26 years old and had been living in Boynton Beach, Florida since she was 13 with her family. She'd grown up in a beautiful gated community, never went without anything that she wanted or needed. And she was always described as a loyal, bubbly and fun loving young woman. And according to her family, she went on to work in real estate and had a very bright future. But there seemed to be a side to Dahlia that nobody ever fully knew. So Dahlia had expensive taste, which isn't all too surprising or abnormal, seeing as she had been around it her entire life. And it seemed very important to her that she continue to live a lavish lifestyle, even as she prepared to leave her parents' home. So Dahlia made a choice that made this very easy for her. Dahlia began to make friends with an assortment of men that were very well off, and it seemed she realized that getting money and favors from these men was a lot easier than climbing the real estate ladder in a very competitive state. Mm. She was beautiful, she was charming, she could lure anyone in with her sweet personality and her sex appeal, so without anyone knowing, she put herself on an escort website, and this led her to her husband, Michael, or Mike DiPolito. So one weekend in 2009, Mike was looking for some company for a few days and looked into a local escort site and was floored when he saw Dahlia. When they met, they ended up hitting it off and they realized that what they had was much more real than they ever really intended or expected. So they began to speak to each other every day. They would go on dates and eventually had plans to get married. But there were a few bumps along this road. The first is that Michael was married. <laughs> so that's, I mean... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a big bump there, okay? Yeah. 
Um, you know, but Dahlia apparently wasn't bothered by this in the slightest. And Michael ensured her that he was going through the divorce process. So everything was fine. Oh, and no guy's secondly, ever told that story before. I know. And she <laughs> defends us very, very seriously. She says that he showed her pictures of documents, legal documents, but... Obviously, a lot of people question this. Yeah. Uh, but second of all, Michael, which doesn't help his case, was also a convicted felon. He had served two years in prison in the early 2000s and was only five years into his 28 years of probation. Michael had been thrown in prison after being found guilty of scheme to defraud, unlicensed telemarketing, and grand theft auto. Ooh. He basically would cold call older individuals and scam them into horrible stock schemes, steal their money. So basically, he was in a lot of trouble for this and also owed $191,000 in restitution to his victims. So clearly this, I mean, it's a difficult situation. Yeah. Plus, they didn't know each other very well. But don't worry, this didn't deter Dahlia. So within six months of meeting each other, they ended up getting married at the local courthouse. Now, aside from their families being shocked, their relationship appeared wholesome. Mike was head over heels for Dahlia and Dahlia seemed thrilled to settle down. Michael would take her on extravagant vacations, um, you know, got her anything that she ever wanted, which is exactly what she wanted. And she ended up being able to move into Mike's nice town home and a good neighborhood, and they fell into a routine. They would wake up at 5 a.m. every morning, go to the nearby LA Fitness to work out, grab a Starbucks coffee, and then go about their day. But on the morning of August 5th, 2009, Dahlia ventured out to the gym alone. Michael was apparently recovering from getting liposuction and was under the doctor's orders to stay at home. Too many coffees? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> More than likely. <laughs> at around 6 a.m. that morning, Dahlia got a phone call from the local police department asking her to return to her home immediately. And when she arrived, she was informed that her husband had been shot twice and was no longer alive. Now, it just so happened that the show Cops was also filming Boynton Police Department at the time. So they were able to capture the videos that ended up on international news of Dahlia screaming and collapsing into the police's arms in distress. Mm. She was quickly whisked away to the police station under the assumption that she was going to help the police nail down the killer. But what Dahlia didn't know is that she had been busted. The perfect relationship that appeared on the outside was anything but. Dahlia, the entire time that she was dating and married to Michael, had been talking to and or having physical relationships with other men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of which was a man named Muhammad, who was a well-off Florida businessman. Her favorite type of man. Yeah. Dahlia had met Muhammad about a decade prior, and according to him, they had a very casual relationship that was mainly just physical. But Dahlia would still always pop up occasionally in his text when she needed something, usually to complain about the current man in her life. So a few weeks prior to Michael's murder, Dahlia had reached out to Muhammad and met him at a local gas station. She explained to him that he was abusive, but that he was also a really nice nerdy guy, but that she was also just tired of him. So despite these whiplash contradictory words, Muhammad encouraged them to get a divorce if she really did feel threatened or unhappy. But Dahlia said a divorce wasn't what she was looking for. She wanted Michael killed. Right. And she asked Muhammad if he knew anyone that could do it. Can you so imagine after, that conversation? How that, honey, yeah. Oh, it'd be great if he wasn't around. Do you know anyone that could just, yeah. just, by the way, <laughs> you know, just casually wondering. It's terrible. It's terrible. I know. So after leaving the meeting, Muhammad was horrified because he genuinely felt like Dahlia would eventually find someone to kill Michael. And based on their texts and conversations about this, he was worried that it would somehow end up pinned on him, okay. understandably. Yeah. And also to do the morally right thing, Muhammad went to the police station. He, inthor he informed authorities that Dahlia's plan was to kill her husband. And unfortunately, because their relationship seemed to be, honestly, it seems more like a booty call situation if I'm being really honest. He didn't yeah. know her last name. He didn't know where she lived. So they had to figure out some way to get to her. So authorities ended up encouraging him to be a part of a sting operation to find her identity and hopefully get to her husband in time. So Muhammad's car was outfitted with a wire, cameras, and he met Dahlia at the same gas station parking lot and informed her that even though he didn't tell her before, he did in fact know someone that could help her. And she was like thrilled, like over the moon. All of this was captured on tape. Oh it's disturbing God. how excited she was about this. Yeah. So Dahlia handed over a stack of cash to pay for the weapon. 
and to secure the hitman, as well as two photos of Michael to make sure that the right man was taken down. At this point, she reiterated as well that Michael was still a very sweet and nice husband. She was just over him and that nobody would ever suspect she had anything to do with his murder. After all, she's a bubbly and sweet young woman. Mm -hmm. Like this girl's tiny, like doesn't look like a threat. The Florida's at this point knew that they had what they needed to prove that she was part of a murder for hire plot. I mean, she captured they captured on video and audio her paying for this, but they wanted to make sure that they had enough to really put her away, so they kept going. A Boynton police officer went undercover and played the part of the hitman himself to meet with Dahlia to finalize plans. Wow. She showed up as if she had done this multiple times before. I mean, there was no fear. There was no hesitation. She got herself dressed in like a skimpy little dress, did her makeup, did her hair, and she just waltzed into that car like she owned the place. That's such a good point. Like, can you imagine that moment of you sitting across the table from someone that you're paying to kill someone? Like, you would think that this is someone that kills people for a living, and I'm just sitting across the table from them, and yeah, we're, we're mm -hmm. I'm going to engage them in business. And she was so not phased at all. Wow. So the hitman, aka the police officer, informed her that once they parted ways, she couldn't go back on her decision, that she would never be able to contact him. There was no changing anything. To which she replied she was 5,000% sure she wanted her husband killed. And she even said she needed it done that week, <laughs> like as soon as possible. Wow. So while Dahlia had plans with who she believed to be a hitman to go alone to the gym one morning, knowing she would return to her husband dead like she was fully prepared to walk into her home and see her dead husband the police were preparing a fake or to fake a crime scene to see how far she would take it so this brings us back to that morning of the 5th just after dahlia left for the gym authorities knocked on the dipolito home door and informed michael that his wife had been caught hiring a hitman to kill him and they took him off to a safe location. And obviously cops filmed this, so there's video footage of this too. And he just like collapses onto the stairs behind him and is sitting there in a complete state of shock. Yeah. At this point, the scene was prepped. They brought in numerous cop cars. There was police tape, there was fingerprint dust. They acted like they printed the entire door. I mean, it was the whole nine yards. And then Dahlia was called and the show began. Now, when Sergeant Frank Ramsey began to inform her that her husband had been killed, we know that she screamed and cried, but she also did this before the full sentence was even out. He hadn't even said the husband had been killed yet, and she just collapses into tears. So this really sealed the deal that she had been waiting for this to happen. After all, she had planned it. Yeah. When she was taken to the station, Dahlia was questioned about people that may want to harm her husband. And she began to explain that she basically threw him under the bus. She said he was a recovering alcoholic, so that could have been involved. She said that he did drugs and he had tons of enemies from the days when he was in stock fraud. She also explained that he was about to get off of parole early. And this was making victims and the men he worked with very angry. Mm hmm so ultimately, after letting her endlessly go on with reasons why everyone else but her wanted to kill Michael, authorities confronted her with the truth that she had hired someone to kill her husband and they had the entire thing on tape. And the man that she believed was a hitman was actually an undercover cop and she had just denied knowing him 10 minutes earlier. Even better, they opened up the interrogation room door to show her Michael standing there alive and well. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, they got her good. Yeah, this is like, is this an MTV show? Is this like pranked or punked oh. or something? <laughs> <laughs> you, you just wait. <laughs> ah, I'm so happy you said that. Did Paulie and Vinny from Jersey Shore jump out after? Ah, oh man, see, here we pranked. go, even better. So Dahlia <laughs> repeatedly stated she did nothing wrong. At this point, she's just in tears. And she said she had no part in the scheme they spoke of she you know kept this claim all the way to court and she even had the nerve to call michael from jail and ask him for help getting an attorney oh my goodness wow mm -hmm. wow and now for the moment that you've all been waiting for the once excuse. in court Here <laughs> i it comes. can't even get it out <laughs> everyone prepare to take your five minute laughing break <laughs> and john you just made it so much better so once in court in april of 2011 Dahlia's attorney stated that Dahlia didn't actually want to kill her husband. She just wanted to become the star of a reality TV show. No. <laughs> Wait. She She's saying that she went with this whole thing because she wanted to be on Cops? <laughs> Not even Cops. Actually, she, her and her husband enjoy Jersey Shore a lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
and a bunch of the other absolutely horrific reality TV shows. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Dahlia's attorney never let her on stand, but made the defense that basically Michael was in on this scheme and they planned to film everything and then post it to YouTube and they were going to hand it over to companies that may land them a spot for their phenomenal acting skills. Oh my goodness. Wow. They, because they didn't know cops was filming, you know, we'll okay. get to that. But they brought proof that Dahlia had, in fact, <laughs> looked up a few reality TV show casting websites, but that was their only solid evidence of this. And Michael was saying, you know, this is far from true. The prosecution also pointed out how this made pretty much absolutely no sense. Overwhelming evidence ended up being found to support the idea that Dahlia just genuinely wanted Michael out of the picture and she also wanted his money. Well, and wouldn't so, he agree with her? Like, if that was true, if they were really doing this as some type of mm -hmm. television stunt, why is he going to send her up the river and not come out and say, yeah, yeah, she's right. We actually did this on purpose. Like, it, it just know. it doesn't hold up at all. No, and I go into more reasons why later. It just... Yeah. It's, it's a mess and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so authorities ended up finding that Dahlia had offered to help Michael take care of the $191,000 of restitution. She basically told him if he came up with 100000 that she would supply the 91000 But he was supposed to give her all of the money and she would wire it to his lawyer. <laughs> now, allegedly, and I can't clear this up, but allegedly he did in fact give her $100,000, but his lawyer said that Dahlia never sent it in. There also were dozens of texts with another man, not Muhammad, not Michael, but a man named Mike. <laughs> That was okay. an ex-boyfriend of hers. Okay. The text basically showed them planning to plant drugs on Mike. They were going to plant drugs like ecstasy, coke, Xanax, and we're going to call it into police as an anonymous tip and have him thrown in jail for violating probation. And they even very unsuccessfully went through with this, might I add, when Michael took her on a nice vacation to stay at the Ritz-Carlton on the coast. She took this moment to plant drugs in his car. They put in an anonymous tip. Authorities came, but ended up finding nothing. But Michael himself ended up finding a bag of drugs the next day when he went to get gas. And he even confronted Dolly about it, and she said it wasn't her. Now, after this failed, Dahlia even tried to kill Michael herself by poisoning his Starbucks sweet tea with antifreeze. Wow. And he remembers spitting it out and all he didn't he was confronted with all of this by authorities after the fact and he was like wait a minute all these things happened and i just thought it was nothing right you know but this was her trying to get me um and her and the other ex-boyfriend would speak a lot about how they were going to freeze funds and transfer funds and assets to make sure she had power over them when he was dead they even planned to move into michael's home together to start their own life when he was gone and ultimately dahlia was found guilty for solicitation of murder and was sentenced to 20 years in prison but this was far from over after claiming issues with jury selection, she ended up with a brand new trial in 2015. And guess what? Her attorney decided to use the exact same defense. <laughs> I kid you not. The second time of saying, oh, but like she didn't mean to. This wasn't real. She just wants to be in a reality TV show. I mean, they must have had nothing else to go on. And and there was such good documentation on the police mm -hmm. side that they had to hold on to some reason that would justify all that. So I, yep. I kind of get why they ran it again. Do you know what the issue was with the jury selection? That's such a weird. I didn't see anything about it. I couldn't okay. find anything deep into it. But this is like a really, really large case. This is, I mean, this was a huge one. So I'm sure I just didn't, I yeah. just barely scratched the surface with a lot of it. Sure. Um, but, you know, in this trial, they actually said because they had to explain Muhammad, which they failed to do the first trial. They actually said this time that it wasn't just Dahlia and her husband that planned this, but Muhammad was in on it too. Okay. Okay. Again, they were probably trying to, you know, get his confession out the door. Mm -hmm. So this time, Dolly's attorney let her take the stand at the pretrial hearing to share her story about how this was one giant plan and all of these videos were just her acting. And apparently, <laughs> it was so bad and lacking information and unbelievable that the judge just dismissed her and the attorney had to entirely drop this defense because she made it such a joke. Yeah, yeah. There was no evidence at all that Michael ever met or knew Muhammad. Muhammad himself is the one that turned her in. And all of the video evidence that she says they plan to put on YouTube, 
It was all taken by authorities and cops. <laughs> so what was their plan to like, they never, what they were going to film it, but they certainly never filmed anything. Oh, you've never what done that, Danielle? Do? I, fake a murder and then be like, hey, police, um, I just faked a murder and you caught it. Do you mind if I borrow the memory card real quick? Because I need to put this on YouTube. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't know that. It's a great way if you want to do it like a prank outside or something, you call the cops, they show up with the body cams and then yeah. you, you prank them and yeah, you can use their body cam footage later and put that on YouTube. Great. Exactly. Perfect plan. <laughs> Terrible. So you can see how this obviously just like didn't go well for her. You know, yeah. also if Muhammad's in on this and if this was a big plan, like why didn't you let Muhammad in on it? And like, why would he have told on you? None of it makes any sense. And you know, when you got caught, why didn't, why wasn't that the first thing that you said? Yeah. And I'm not surprised of her having this altered <clears throat> reality that she's living in. What I'm really surprised about is the lawyer going with it. <laughs> Oh, no, don't worry. <laughs> it keeps it keeps getting better. Oh, no. So the second trial in 2016 actually ended in a mistrial because the defense now had to go with the claim that authorities acted badly, basically, because they had cops film everything and, you know, they used that. And the prosecution also did like one of the worst jobs I have ever seen. They brought a very weak case. They basically didn't put a lot of effort into it because they assumed the defense had nothing, but it ended up making both of them look horrible. They didn't even bring Michael onto the stand himself when he survived through this. So yeah. basically it ended in a mistrial. So it went to trial for the third time in 2017. She hired new attorneys and guess what the defense was? No, she got yes. another attorney to run that same defense. Two very famous attorneys. I can't remember their names, oh. but she got them to run the exact same defense that she was acting in these videos that everybody was in on it, like Michael and Muhammad. Like, I just, I don't understand how they managed to do that when like the videos weren't even anything they took themselves. Like, how did you plan to upload this to YouTube? Like not, there's no part of this story that adds up to the end goal, like from any right. angle. No, no. But, you know, they really pushed it. They fought for this and they actually closed their final arguments out by basically guilting the jury into letting her free because while awaiting for trial, she had a baby with the service repairman that visited her home to fix something. So now she had a newborn to take care of. <laughs> now there's a reality show. <laughs> I know. Like the whole thing is just a big reality show. Like she got one whether she actually wanted one or not. <laughs> and it didn't work out well for her. Oh. Uh, but it turned out after only an hour of deliberation, the jury said... I actually saw some of the jurors. They were like, oh, we all knew from the start. We basically looked at each other and said guilty. Yeah. <laughs> she was sentenced to 16 years in prison with a release date of 2032. But don't worry, Dahlia's attorneys did in fact try to take the exact same defense for the fourth time all the way to the Supreme Court in early 2020, which was very quickly shot down. But now her lawyers apparently are still desperately attempting to somehow get her another trial. And it is almost absurd how strongly they believe they seem to genuinely believe that she really was trying to act. Well, they now, believe my, it as long as the bill's being paid, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. But I mean, the she does have many, many supporters. And, you wow. know, I'm one with an open mind. But I think it is the largest load of crap <laughs> yeah. I've ever seen. Um, so it's very interesting to see the people that genuinely think that's a possibility. Because even using common sense, it makes no sense. But, you know, since Michael has remarried and he actually he's been very kind, he actually tried to give her tips because he had his own run in with the law and being in jail. Sure. And he said it was really sad because he saw someone that he did genuinely care about go away for making a really bad and a really avoidable decision. But he also says that he's glad it ended the way it did instead of the way that she had planned. There so. is something when when you were originally talking about the length that law enforcement went to for kind of capturing yeah. her it did feel weird like i'm starting to wonder yeah. like is this entrapment at some point like when when you're creating characters that are engaging with this mm -hmm. criminal aspect and i know it, it doesn't sound that different from when we see like prostitution stings and they've got cops set up in a hotel room oh, yeah. and there's one guy that acts like he's the john and they bring her back and then a bunch of cops run in and they arrest like i i, I get that but there is some line in my mind that this is getting really close to is like, is this a form of entrapment of some kind? Like that's where I thought the lawyers honestly probably would have had a stronger argument than this silly uh, reality show idea. 
I mean, I would definitely think so. And I think that may have been what they were trying to do in the second trial where they were saying yeah. there was like a lot of police misconduct and overstepping boundary boundaries and bringing cops in. But I mean, I'm pretty sure they did prove that they didn't specifically bring cops in for this. It just so happened to be going. And, you know, in my opinion, what I think probably happened is I can absolutely see the idea of that being considered entrapment. However, this was kind of like a big thing. Like she was trying to kill somebody. Yeah. You know, and when it comes to situations like that, I mean, I understand them hiring or having someone go undercover as a hitman because they already have video of her speaking to Muhammad about it. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it is very important to also be able to showcase during trial that like she actually did speak to an undercover cop and like she was ready to go through with this. Yeah. We double check to make sure, you know, dot your T or dot your T's. Yes, dot your T's and cross your eyes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think but it just morally that. it just morally raises an interesting question because what if the reality was yeah. Muhammad didn't have any friends like that. She really didn't have any other avenue to get that done. And it wasn't a reality that she could have affected. Like she really couldn't have done that. I I, I hear the same kind of yeah. argument come up with um bait cars. You know, occasionally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they'll mm -hmm. leave a car out. They'll leave it running. The doors open. Someone walks by. They jump in, and then you know they get arrested when the car automatically shuts down a block down the street after they go driving off. Um, yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Like if that, if the reality of that didn't exist, would that have been a criminal, or would that person just have gone walking down the street and not saw this fake opportunity and then lunged towards it? Um, yeah, I don't know. See, yeah. I'm the kind of person. I'm the kind of person, though, that leans to the side of, I mean, that's a big thing mm -hmm. to, you know, even consider having a hitman hired. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a big thing to even consider in itself. Yeah. And so, I don't know, and also put together with the fact that Muhammad was so scared she would go through with it with someone else because she seemed very determined. She even says that and you know, some of right. the video that was captured that she was very determined to have this happen. And she had already tried to kill him herself. They just hadn't known about it. Yeah, that's true. So that's I mean, a really good point. I feel like it worked out in a way that's good, but I can absolutely see where that could have been pushing it far. And I do think the whole faking of a crime scene thing and convincing her that he was dead. Yeah. I do think that was a little unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. Did they have to go that far? Like this could have been done on a phone no. call. They take her right to the station. Like they didn't even have to have her at the scene. But yeah. exactly. But then also in the same breath, I'm like, well, I'm kind of glad they did because that might have helped make the case since somehow this <laughs> went to trial three right. separate times. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it also makes for a really good reality show. That's great footage. I know. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Good one, Danielle. And I love that uh, it's only one excuse, but mm -hmm. they try to run that excuse three times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think and you a found huge a thank good you one. to 2020 and Oxygen because they have a ton of coverage on that. And there's multiple documentaries that I highly suggest everyone watch on it. It was awesome. interesting. Awesome. Good job. Well, that's one of the stories. We got another one to go. But first, we're going to take this very short break. Simplify your life and cut out stressful meal planning with HelloFresh. Their no contact delivery brings a box right to my door with step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients. Everything I need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. With more than 20 recipes featured every week, you'll never get bored. Last week, I made HelloFresh's amazing black bean and poblano tacos. It hit all my check boxes. Quick and easy, tasted great, and it was vegetarian. As a matter of fact, when I told Danielle about it, she was like, oh, the black bean and poblano it's, tacos. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. I actually meal prep it for myself on my own for lunch every week. Nice. <laughs> Eating healthier has never been easier with low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options. Of course, they always have great options every week for us meat eaters too. Every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers and you won't be overbuying produce. They send the perfect amount for the recipes, which is both easier on your wallet and the planet. Go to hellofresh.com forward slash 10 crime after crime and use code 10 crime after crime. You'll get 10 free meals, including free shipping. Give Crime After Crime's number one sponsor a try. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash 10 Crime After Crime and use code 10 Crime After Crime for 10 free meals, including free shipping. We promise you're going to love HelloFresh. Welcome back, you guys. Are you ready for another true crime story? Oh. I'm thrilled. 
I'm you told ready. me you were going to bring it this month, so I'm here for it. I am ready and waiting. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is. Um, I think this is a good one, Danielle. Uh, yours, yours is great, um, but uh, this this excuse. I'm going to actually. I'll come out right at the top and let you guys know. All right. So, you might have heard of the Twinkie defense in relation to the Dan White case where basically yes. his eating Twinkies was brought up as a sign of him dealing with depression. But what about the too fat to kill defense? Mm. As in, I couldn't have committed the crime because I'm too obese. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, mm. well, I'm interested to see if I can be convinced. <laughs> let's see how it plays out. A woman named Stacy Eights got married in 1999 and four years and two children later went through a bitter divorce and custody battle with her ex-husband, 40-year-old New Jersey pharmaceutical executive Paul Dunsack. This took a serious toll on Stacy. In 2006, Stacy was unemployed with financial problems, on the verge of losing her condo, and having serious health issues that had started actually back during her marriage, including an illness that was paralyzing part of her face. Paul told friends that Stacy had actually been abusing prescription drugs during their marriage. Either way, after the divorce, her ex seemed to be living the good life. Stacy's father, Edward Eights, who happens to be a Florida man, hint, hint. Mm. He wasn't too happy about that. Uh, everything that his daughter was going through, this guy seemingly doing well. And he also thought that what he referred to as her disfigurement was why Paul decided to end the marriage. Quote, she wasn't a trophy bride no more, Eights told Dateline in an interview. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great way to talk about your daughter, huh? I know. My goodness. Oh, goodness. Um, yeah, I also love that this guy's last name is Eights. I know. I wanted to say something and <laughs> yeah. I kept my mouth shut, so I'm really happy that you brought that up. A-T-E-S. <laughs> Paul met someone new in 2005, a single mother named Lori, and they began dating. In 2006, the couple would be planning a wedding for the following year, and they decided to combine their families and their homes before walking down the aisle. Lori was going to move into Paul's $1.1 million home in Ramsey, New Jersey, but was currently living in Wyckoff, which was about four miles away. Paul found himself mostly staying at Lori's home while they prepared for it to be sold. He got into the habit of going to work, stopping at his house in the evening to check his email and feed his parrot, and then heading back to Lori's for dinner and to spend the night. Because the Ramsey house was unoccupied, Paul never left the air conditioner on, and he always kept the doors locked. Meanwhile, in Port Lucie, Florida, Edward Eights lived in a trailer with his wife, Dottie, which was on a property owned by their other daughter, Evelyn. Evelyn lived in a home that was also on the property and had a personal computer with internet access, which Edward frequently used. With Stacy's financial trouble, there was some consideration about her moving back home with the family, but the child custody agreement between her and Paul was a major stopping block. They're in New Jersey. Obviously, the family's yeah. in Florida. Uh, on August 23rd, 2006, Paul was doing his usual routine, heading home to feed his parrot and check his email. He was on his cell phone actually talking to Lori as he walked in the front door. He noticed the air conditioner was on. Knowing that Lori had been there earlier that day, he said, I can't believe you left the freaking air conditioner on. She said, I didn't. Next, she heard Paul say, no, oh no, a scream and then a thud. She immediately called 911, keeping Paul's phone call still on active on the other line. Soon, his call disconnected from his end. Police arrived minutes later, but the killer was already gone. Paul had been shot six to seven times. The crime scene, completely clean. No hair, fiber, fingerprints, DNA, no murder weapon, not even a shell casing. What, oh, what, wow. yeah, what was clear to investigators was with that many shots, this seemed like an emotionally driven act. Mm -hmm. They quickly ruled out robbery when they noticed that Paul was wearing his Rolex and he had $300 in cash on him. 
They also noticed that the locks to Paul's home had been aggressively picked before the murder. They quickly found Stacy, right? Prime suspect yeah, number one. Yeah, that'd be the first person I would go to, yeah. Yeah, who's going to benefit from this? But she had a solid alibi. She had a doctor's appointment for her son. They spoke to Paul's brother, who didn't hold anything back and let detectives know exactly what direction to look in. He stated to them, I can't believe he actually did it. They asked who, and he replied, Ed Eights. Detectives tried to call Ed at home. They got his wife, Dottie. She told them that Ed was visiting his mother in Louisiana, but she didn't know how to get a hold of him because he left his cell phone at home. That's not suspicious. Right. Super convenient. <laughs> this guy needs, uh, he needs to start a reality show, apparently. Uh, 24 hours into the investigation and a major person of interest can't be contacted, but Ed does call the investigators telling them where he is. They ask if he can document his trip to Louisiana, which he says he can't because he paid for everything in cash, slept in his car, and he left his cell phone behind. So investigators decide they're going to fly to Louisiana to interview him in person. But by the time they arrive, Ed hired a lawyer and wasn't talking. They were able to speak briefly with his sister, Brenda, who told them that Ed arrived on Tuesday, one day before the shooting. Investigators weren't sure what to believe, so they started tapping Ed's phone lines. A phone call between him and his sister, Brenda, makes it clear that the story of when he arrived in Louisiana was false. You were there when I got there on Tuesday, he told her. I just got to make sure that we're all... We're all saying the same thing if it comes to it, he stated in the recorded call. She agreed. Oh, man. Yeah. Investigators would find additional information from cell phone tower pings to support that Ed had actually traveled to Paul's home in weeks prior to this, possibly for surveillance and to test aspects of his plan. Ed would be taken into custody on June 12th, 2007, nearly 10 months after the shooting and charged with murder. His defense attorney was Walter Lesnovich, whose website states that he has more than 40 years experience in personal injury law, medical malpractice, and as a criminal attorney. The site also states that Walt has the reputation of being a lawyer who fights for his clients, and he decides to put up a fight for Edward Eights using a truly absurd defense. He told the court his client's weight has led to asthma, sleep apnea, and other obesity-related ailments. Edward Eights is five foot eight and weighs 285 pounds. Quote, you look at Ed and you don't need to hear it from a doctor, Lesnovich told the courtroom. <laughs> I mean, just throw him under the bus. <laughs> I mean, just way to just take this man and drag him through the mud when he's already yeah. being charged with murder. <laughs> yeah, hey, Ed, I got, I got your way out of this. You are too fat. You're just too fat. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's how he puts it to the courtroom. Look at Ed. You don't need to hear it from a doctor as he rolls out the too fat to murder defense. Paul was shot numerous times as he walked down a hallway. Lesnovich said the first shot came from a staircase that led down to a basement. And that's based on the trajectory of the first wound to Paul's leg. That was followed by several shots fired at the same level as Paul. So in order to do that, Lesnovich says that Eights would have had to run up the stairs. Okay, I was wondering how he was going to defend this. Like, what is he going to say? He can't, like, break into a house because it'd be too exhausting? Or Right. Okay, that's interesting. And then they introduced an expert witness. They brought in Eights' doctor, and he testified that him bounding up the stairs would have caused Eights to become short of breath and shaky, concluding that this would make it difficult for eights to keep his wrist straight enough to accurately fire a gun look at him lesnovich told jurors <laughs> i mean jeez could you could you imagine being that person just look at him i know <laughs> i mean hey if it gets you off of murder oh, i guess it's okay god jeez <laughs> Even the thing about running up the stairs, I'm like, really? Like, that's enough? What? And you're not going to be able to hold your arm? I, I don't know. I think it's a load of baloney. It, it's, not, it's not like you're running up the stairs on your arms. <laughs> then, I know. I was about I mean, to say, like. <laughs> geez. Uh, 
Oh, boy. So one of the main points of this defense is that Ed was too fat to have climbed the stairs and then fired that many accurate shots mm -hmm. from a distance of approximately four feet. Uh, let me also say, Ed, former military... Uh, okay, cool. So he absolutely could have. <laughs> yeah. Now, apparently he was like more of a, like a tech technical type person, but I think even going mm -hmm. into the military, you're going to have basic weapon skills. So, um, well, yeah, you start, you usually start off, you know, on like a path altogether, you learn the same things and then you eventually split up, but you still have yeah. certain things that you have to learn. Yeah. And, and he was known to have weapons on top of that. So this, this is a guy that, that was familiar with, with weapons already prior to this. Um, but yeah, we're talking about the shooting distance up at the closer range was approximately yeah. four feet. And how many steps are we talking about for him to have bounded up that staircase? Mm -hmm. Four. You're joking. <laughs> no. <laughs> he was... I was thinking like an entire staircase. I was uh, like, no. you know, maybe that's plausible if it's like a big staircase. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because if I'm being honest... When I don't do cardio frequently, you know, going upstairs is exhausting. I get it. <laughs> sure, sure. No, we're, no, we're talking four steps. Uh, basically, the staircase had like a turn in it. So he was likely standing on a perch where the staircase yeah. like changed direction. It was only four steps down from the entrance. Uh, quote, he could go up four steps, but could he then maintain the pistol straight and not miss? That's a tough shot. His attorney, Lesnovich, later told Good Morning America. And also, Danielle, keep in mind, Paul, the first shot from that mm -hmm. perch, hit him in the leg. So he probably wasn't going to be running away after that initial shot, even if Ed took a full minute to get up the four steps. That's what I'm saying. I mean, when you're hitting someone in the leg like that and just the shock in general, I'm sure yeah. he didn't go pretty much anywhere. Oh, yeah. This guy's in your home. I mean, uh, half, yeah. uh, especially half the instinct you're going to have is probably to attack or to probably mm -hmm. try to get this person out of your home right off the bat. Uh, and then, yeah, being shot in the leg right off the first <laughs> shot. Yeah, so I don't know. This this defense really doesn't hold up for me. But uh, to add to the too fat theory, Lesnovich continued, it would have been impossible for Eights to clean up all the shell casings and flee the house before the police arrived minutes later. Then Eights would have had to have driven alone for 21 hours straight to get from New Jersey to his mother's house in Louisiana, which obviously an overweight person just couldn't do, right? I mean, driving for 21 hours. It's absurd that they're actually justifying one with the other. <laughs> they, they even, they tried to bring up like, um, yeah, you're, you're going to have this big push of adrenaline, but after six hours, you, you know, you're going to crash essentially. You're just, your energy is going to drop out. Yeah, but so he stops and he loads up on caffeine or, I mean, there's so many different mechanisms that you could do to keep yourself up for a day or illegal drugs. I mean, there's all kinds well of. Exactly. And how on earth does being too fat come into play at that point? Like, it's not like he's exerting any physical activity driving yeah. in the car or... Yeah, for driving. Yeah, I don't I don't get it. Now, the shell casing thing is kind of interesting. But yeah, when you get a sense of the amount of work that he did in advance of this, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised if he uh, made something that was either catching the shells as they were ejecting exactly. or something along those lines. I didn't find anything directly to that, but... I, I, that's the only point that I can kind of agree with a little bit of, you know, six to seven shots, and then you're going to wait there long enough to try to scramble around and pick up all these shell casings before you get out. Like, Oh, no, absolutely not. Especially if he's been in the military and he was someone who had weapons. I know plenty of people that have been in the military and have weapons, and all of the changes that they make to them, yeah, it, does, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest yeah. that he found something or bought something i don't know what's available that would catch that so he wouldn't have to worry about it right right he clearly put a lot of thought into this if he went all the way there oh, to scope sure it out first yeah <laughs> so yeah. he's had plenty of time to think about it yeah we're gonna get into this, and he's, some of these and details he's done it here. once before he's driven up there once before oh yeah was he too fat then to do it <laughs> clearly right. not right you know he's he's yeah but he didn't go out. all the way to louisiana after that so yeah 21 yeah. hour drive uh, the prosecution put together a very strong case detailing the surveillance trip taken prior to the shooting, internet searches found on computers that Edward used that included how to commit the perfect murder, how hmm. to build a silencer, hmm. how to pick a lock, and they also found an online order for a lock picking set that was delivered to E8s. 
But the biggest moment in the courtroom was when his sister Brenda took the stand and admitted that she had lied to investigators. Ed had actually arrived in Louisiana a day after the shooting. The trial lasted 23 days and included Ed taking the stand where he tried to clean up the I arrived on Tuesday versus I arrived on Thursday story. His statement this time, oh boy. he actually arrived on Wednesday around the same time of the shooting. A That's convenient. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> it's very convenient. <laughs> uh, a neighbor of his mother's testified that he saw a car like the one that Ed drives there specifically on Wednesday. However, legal analysts think that the shifting story was just too much for jurors to take. So, yeah, you know, having a witness like that, look, the guy had no reason to lie. But exactly him thinking he saw Ed's vehicles quite a bit different to, you know, yeah, Ed came over and had coffee with me. I know he was there yeah, on Wednesday. Exactly. The panel of eight women and four men issued its verdict. Edward Eights looked down and shook his head as he was found guilty of murder, burglary, witness tampering, and weapons charges. He would wind up being sentenced to life in prison. The 65-year-old won't be eligible for parole for 66 years. Good grief. At his sentencing, Eights said... All I can say is I'm innocent. The jury got it wrong. This is a terrible miscarriage of justice. His attorney thinks the too fat theory was undermined by Edward Eights himself. Edward testified that he had lost 60 pounds while in jail awaiting trial. Quote, it visually impacts it. I'm probably the only person in his life that told him not to lose weight, his lawyer Lesnovich said. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. I can't believe he even suggested that. Like, don't lose weight. We need you to be fat, please. <laughs> like, what? Well, he, he his whole defense is look at him, right? Exactly. So. <laughs> no, just look like, at him. really, look at this guy. Would you look at him? You don't need a doctor. Just look at him. Exactly. Uh, CBS News said it best with their article titled, Edward Eights said he was too fat to kill. Judge says he'll fit just fine in prison. Oh my goodness. That is perfect. <laughs> that is absolutely perfect. Yeah. A uh, big thank you to NBC, Dateline, Fox News, CBS News, ABC News, CTV News, NJ.com, Newsday, FindLaw.com, and LMLLawyers.com, uh, which is the law firm that Lesnovich is from. And for which anyone... Is, oh, I was just going to say... Go ahead. Go ahead. For, an, for anyone, anyone interested... interested? Uh, he also represents people in gastric bypass cases where I think he does try out different too fat <laughs> defenses. <laughs> you know, I do want to say that I think that, and I hate even saying this because obviously this man, you know, committed murder. He needs to be in jail, but yeah. obviously lawyers also have a job. Yeah. And you know, you kind of want to give this lawyer some applause for even finding any way to argue this with that much information that the prosecution was able to bring forward with all of this very clear as day evidence. Yeah. Yeah. I got to be honest, but, like looking at his background, he he's a pretty accomplished attorney. Well, that is why I'm almost kind of mad. He even went to this length for that, because if you're so good at what you do, you know what I'm saying? If you yeah. if you want to keep this great reputation as a criminal attorney, why, take Why the on case? earth yeah. would you do something like that to your career? Yeah. Because that's absurd. Yeah. Well, there's an angle um, that actually came up in his bio. I, I didn't put it in the script, but he talks about this case in the bio on his website. Yeah. And basically all he talks about is that, you know, he did the defense for Edward Eights and that led to numerous television appearances and he was on this and he was on that and he was on this and he was on that. So... Maybe that's why you do it. Maybe it's good for your business to have that type of exactly. exposure. Exactly. Just gets your name out there. Yeah. You know, that whole entire like any attention's good attention approach to things. <laughs> right. Right. Um, now, outside of what his daughter Stacy was going through, mm -hmm. I was wondering, did Edward have any other reason to do this? Yeah, uh, me too. According to Paul's family, Ed was always asking for Paul to invest in numerous business schemes. A friend Ooh, of Paul's. So it was like a very personal thing. Yeah, yeah. A friend of Paul's says that uh, these business ideas always went bust. Um, but Paul's mother specifically said that Edward Eights became 
particularly vengeful toward Paul after he refused to give Ed $250,000 to save Eights' struggling golf course. So it's like the money well ran dry and Edward Eights yeah. now had this perfect excuse on top of that of what his daughter was going through. and just went for it well that's yeah. unfortunate what a horrible decision to make <laughs> yeah and then on top of like, that absolutely terrible of course you know um having his grandchildren potentially live with him back in florida might have been yeah. another piece to it as well um he also did try to appeal the decision in 2014 he was yeah. claiming that the wiretapping that was done um and this is somewhat interesting he's in florida his sister's in louisiana and the okay. wiretap is homed in new jersey so um, a lot of states happen in there yeah and from what i understand I, I didn't look this up but i believe between florida and louisiana those states have very tight wiretapping laws and what it takes to do something like that if it's even possible but new jersey doesn't so uh his run at it was basically hey that wiretap that you got that recording between me and my sister you shouldn't have been able to use that in court um, which I don't think would really help a whole lot because they actually got her on the stand from what I understand as well. So that's what I was going to say. And also like, how does, I mean, I understand it was involving numerous different States, but also, I mean, he killed someone then fled a state, right? There's gotta be, there's blurred lines here across yeah. the board. So I feel like you couldn't go with, there wouldn't really be any way to like narrow it down to, was this all right? Or was it not? Is there? Well, I, I don't know. I really, it's interesting. Yeah, I couldn't figure it out myself. There is there is some yeah. logistics to that. I'm kind of like, oh, that is curious because mm -hmm. you're kind of overriding, and this was part of their argument that it's overriding um, the state's laws because you've got this other state that doesn't have those same laws, and now you're recording phone calls that are happening between these two other states. It it did go to the Supreme Court, but the appeal failed, so uh, no big change there. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Edward Eights is too fat to have committed murder. What do you think, That's Daniel? interesting. Actually, I feel like if that had been used properly and with a lack of evidence, that someone could very easily get away with using that defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really uh, do. I mean, it's definitely something that sounds absurd, but I feel like if there was no evidence to prove it, and I mean, you could prove that someone's physical abilities may have prevented them from doing something. Yeah. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's not um, the excuse that you are running with that, you know, they're doing this for a reality show. Like the mm -hmm. believability of it is just, it's so far stretched. I see what you're saying. In this case, it's a little bit closer to a potential defense. Yeah. I don't know if the too fat thing in particular, I think if they, it's interesting that they brought up the diseases because if yeah. they could have tied it like to a specific disease, like, hey, no, he's got blood pressure issues or he's got blood sugar mm -hmm. issues and going through but something just, like this would have given him a heart attack or, you know, like if there was some. Exactly. Um, but yeah, that's. Uh, but no, just just too fat. No, no, he was just too fat to, to run up four <laughs> steps. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. All right, oh, Danielle. It's time for extra stories. And I'm really excited about this one. Let's hear your first extra story. What else did we find while we were looking for these cases? Okay, this one I couldn't pass up speaking about, and I really wanted it to be a main story, but there just wasn't enough to it. So in May of 2011, a man called into authorities saying that his roommate was acting strange and violent around the campground where their trailer was parked in Lorain County, Ohio. Upon arrival, authorities found complaints that this man had been kicking dog cages, growling at people, and just overall wreaking havoc before retreating to his home to pass out. They ended up finding 20-year-old Thomas Straub asleep in his trailer surrounded by knives, swords, and other sharp weapons. When authorities tried to wake him, he actually began to growl at authorities, was speaking in a very thick Russian accent, and threatened to kill someone named Keith. <laughs> so <laughs> this man's very clearly unwell. <laughs> yeah. He was very drunk. He was obviously very dangerous. So he ended up being arrested. And I think the only reason they were able to snag him was because of underage drinking. Okay. Now he ended up apologizing and he actually admitted to authorities that he wasn't actually drunk. 
that he had just been scratched by a wolf while vacationing in Germany. And so now, and I quote, he goes on the attack when the moon is out. He's, I'm not drunk. I'm just a wolf. <laughs> I'm not drunk. I'm a wolf. The, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, not drunk. drunk. I'm a wolf I'm a defense. Wolf. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, now, it is absolutely ridiculous. And he so meant it. But the full moon thing, um, that's for werewolves, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's interesting. And like, like, why were you ever in a position where you were just scratched by a wolf? Like, I would I would literally want to sit him down and be like, okay, tell me this story. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hear about this. So when you were in Germany. Yeah. Well, when you do sit down with him, ask him, what has he got against Keith, man? Leave Keith alone. I know. <laughs> I know. And it's funny, though, because the authorities even said in an interview that they were really shocked the second he was like, I'm killing Keith. And they actually all had to be like, wait a minute, who has who's Keith? Because he was like, your cousin Keith. Or something like that. And so they all had to like go around the room and make sure no one had a cousin? a cousin named Keith. Do you have a cousin? Uh, did, <laughs> he speak, like, okay. did he speak Russian before he was scratched by the wolf? I don't know. Good question mm-hmm. to ask. Mm-hmm. Russian werewolves. Exactly. I would be scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. Hey, now you know how Keith feels. Exactly. Oh, goodness. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you about Muhammad Anwar, who lived in Scotland. And he got pulled over for speeding. When they clocked him at 34 miles per hour over the speed limit, he risked losing his driver's license. But Muhammad decided to appeal to the court with the truth. Between driving from his wife at home to the business that he owned to his other wife in another home (laughs) and then back again, he needed to be able to speed to keep up being a good husband to the two women. I and mean, it seems, absolutely. It's understandable. Right? <laughs> Believe it or not, it actually worked. Saving his license. I'm joking. No, they saved his license. They let him off with only a 200 pound fine. Uh, of course, he has to deal with his wives now being aware of each other. So maybe there's punishment enough in that. You know what's ridiculous, though? Do you think he really was speeding? What if he really was like, dang, I'm late for dinner with my second wife. I have to go. (laughs) Of course. She'll be really mad. You don't think Muhammad's lying, do you? (laughs) Absolutely not. Oh my gosh. Could you imagine that? Look, Mm -hmm. if I'm being real honest, it's my two wives. (laughs) No, I could not imagine that. Oh my gosh. Well, I have a really good short and sweet one that Mm -hmm. may be one of my favorites of the day. May just be because I'm Irish, but a man... (laughs) was found pantless in a Cincinnati man's vehicle after clearly breaking into it. When authorities arrived, a man named Kim LeBlanc explained that he was pretty sure he did drugs. And after doing drugs, a tiny leprechaun actually let him inside the car. So technically, he didn't break into it. The leprechaun did. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know what? That leprechaun's name was Keith. It probably. I know this all ties in together. <laughs> these werewolves from Germany and these Irish leprechauns are just wreaking havoc everywhere. Well, how can you press charges against that guy? I mean, if the leprechaun's the one that opened the car. It's so fascinating, too. He's like, you know, I think I did drugs. <laughs> I think I did drugs. And then a leprechaun appeared. Right. It's like, oh, tell Let me more. Let me in the car. Yeah. <laughs> then, then they get the uh, leprechaun in court and he claimed he was too fat to have opened the car. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, just combine them all together. (laughs) Now, as a sibling, I know that more than once in my life, I screamed, my brother did it. Could Mm -hmm. that work as a criminal defense? Malaysia has very strong anti-drug laws, and twin brothers, Sathis and Sabarish Raj, were facing a death sentence for drug trafficking. There was one problem. Police could only prove that one twin knew they were transporting drugs, and they didn't know which twin it was. Oh, man. So even though they had the DNA of the twin that was driving the car that was moving the drugs, the results were inconclusive because his twin's DNA is nearly identical. (laughs) Talk about getting lucky. Yeah. Well, and and because of that, the judge rather than potentially execute the wrong man, let them both off. What do you do? That's, I know, I was about to say, you can't do anything in that situation. Oh, you know that everyone was so frustrated and infuriated with that case. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. I don't think I've ever heard of a circumstance where that's happened before. I feel like I've seen that in a TV show at some point. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no. Well, I hadn't even thought about it. The fact that, you know, their DNA is identical. I wonder, now I want to go and search up other criminal cases where this could be a thing. I was actually looking into this as the main story and... Um, the simple DNA tests would show mm -hmm. it as identical, but there is variations that happens if they do specific yeah. enough tests where they can they can tell the difference. Um, but that's like okay, a recent good. that's like a recent development. So uh, yeah, <laughs> good because other than that, twins would absolutely take over the world. <laughs> I'm, almost <po> <laughs> right. I'm almost positive of it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Okay, we got to let she them go. It. She did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right that was a good one but who do you guys think will win this month audience you guys get to vote on who told the best most absurd defense story and honestly i think we brought it i was just telling john earlier i feel like this entire season we've both had amazing stories so this is going to be a close one i think so i think so plus i've got that uh, mystery <laughs> helper on the numbers so I was, I was just about to say you, you might take this one if this mystery helper yeah, keeps voting for exactly. you for 500 times yeah i gotta start sending some gifts to someone i don't know who you are um yes yeah, so you can vote at the twitter account at crime after pod for the first seven days after we release the episode or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and you can vote there we do have a link in the description box down below that will take you right to the website or you can still click the little letter i in the top corner of the screen and it will take you there as well at crimeaftercrimepodcast.com you can find all the links you'll ever need including where to find more content by danielle and myself uh check out netflix february 10th uh how to suggest <laughs> that sounds pretty good uh, so it does sound good uh how to suggest <laughs> show topics join our patreon or shop our teespring store as always, a huge, huge, huge thank you to our patrons. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. It's always a ton of fun. You learn a lot about John and I. Plus, patrons also get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special when they join. Absolutely. Uh, we've got a real special episode coming for you guys now. This has been highly, highly requested. We're finally doing it quarantine mm -hmm. crimes. So, we're going to be looking at crimes specifically. We, we, we want the nature of the crimes to be yeah. directly related to the quarantine. So it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, I think, on the research mm -hmm. front. But uh, I think it's going to bring some real interesting conversations. So um, that's the next one. This podcast is produced and hosted by... Daniel Hallen, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love Crime After Crime and they really need to check it out. They're going to love it too. Thank you guys so much for joining us this episode and we will see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.